on my first trip abroad, and uh, as a good American girl from New York, where I went first was to Paris. Somebody drove me to Florence and introduced me to some of the young people there. And among them was uh, this um, uh, blonde, blue-eyed count who was extremely arrogant. He was very, he was very uh, popular with women, so he was very arrogant, so I didn't really like him very much. But um, <clears throat> he was about to leave for <clears throat> me, a diamond hunting expedition in the South American jungle. The thing that attracted me was certainly not diamonds. <clears throat> it was jungle. And in fact, as a child, I was always attracted to Tarzan and everything that had to do with jungles. Because it seemed to me, and, and this is in retrospect, because I didn't have the words then, but I'm sure this was it, because it just, it just feels right, that there was something original about it. There was something right about it. If you're in a jungle and you're a person, person animal, then you've got to be in the right place. It felt as though whatever went wrong, it hadn't gone wrong yet while you were still in the jungle, something like that. And Tarzan even was represented as pure. So that view of man in the jungle was that he's pure when he's in the jungle. I think that was the whole idea, that it was somehow before the fall. So that was very exciting. I mean, to go and, and live in the Stone Age, you know, it's like going to the moon or something, you know, just go and live in the Stone Age from Manhattan. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing and, and um, rich experience for, for a person. And um, I mean, bit by bit, if I, if I looked at my notes, because I always kept journals, which are lost now, unfortunately. But um, the journals that I kept, it looked as though I were making notes for the continuum concept. But in fact, what I was doing was questioning things all the time. And um, so I suppose I was looking for what I found. I then realized that, that I had not just unlearned, as I, as I thought of it, um, a lot of presumptions that we have about human nature. Our civilization has about human nature, such as, for example, boys will be boys, bad, you know. Um, oh, well, it's only human nature, bad. Um, well, you have to socialize children because otherwise they will be antisocial or at least asocial or something. Um, and when you say children, you're talking about human nature. You're talking about the, the material of human nature, which we then uh, live with and, you know, we become, we, we mold it into what becomes adults. Once I, I realized something, I had one or two insights, and then other insights began to go off like popcorn from there. You know, well, if this is true, well, then this must be true. Gosh, wow, you know, and I was quite excited about it. And then... Um, I began to realize that we made a terrible mistake about what human nature is. We just got it wrong. And, you know, amazingly enough, the blindness that I had, I mean, despite the fact that I hadn't finished college and I never read a book, so I was, you know, reasonably illiterate, reason, reasonably unschooled in the culture, at least not academically. So I had, I mean, from my point of view, an advantage in not having rigidified my, my intellectual or my views, let's say. Um, but even so, I was living for literally years. It was over, uh, it was about three years or thereabouts that I was living, looking straight at these Indians, living with them, and not seeing what I was looking at because I just was so blinded by our view that I didn't even notice, amazingly enough, that the children never argued, unsupervised. They'd play together all day, unsupervised. Tiny children from, you know, whatever, crawling, walking age, one year, whatever, up until, you know, the age they could still be called children, 10, 12, and 14, or whatever. They never, not, not only didn't fight, but they never even argued. And, I mean, this is not what we have been taught, is human nature, or boys will be boysing, you know, at all. Um, so I thought, well, boys won't be boys. There's something, something wrong here. Somebody's got something wrong here. But it, it was such a long time before I noticed. One just thinks, oh, well, these are little savages. They're, you know, they've got red paint on and they have little loincloths and feathers in their ears, so they're not people. Well, of course, they are people. They're exactly the same species as we, except that they are behaving the way we have all evolved to behave. And we are completely crazed with 
with being mistreated as infants and children, treated inappropriately for our species. And as a result, what we have done, and, and I'm putting it strongly on purpose because it is this bad, we have actually, we have actually created an antisocial population by this very means. It's not an accident. Nobody's born rotten. You don't have just bad kids. It's not true. There is no such thing, but you can make them. And ironically, the reason that you make children be bad or antisocial is the way, the way it's possible to do this with, with this profoundly social animal that we in fact are is by um, the fact that, that, they, that they are, that we are so social, the fact that our, our parents, our tribesmen, our authority figures, whatever you want to call them, so clearly expect us to be bad or antisocial or, or um, greedy or selfish or dirty or destructive or self-destructive or whatever. We so clearly are expected to do this that because we are so social, ironically, we meet those expectations because our sociality actually develops in human beings that way. The way it is meant to develop, that we meet the expectations of our elders. And now this is, whenever historically this reversal took place, when our elders stopped expecting us to be social and expected us to be antisocial, just to put it in gross terms, that's when the real fall took place. And we are paying for it so dearly. I mean, just imagine the alienated um, people that we have around us. Why do we have to lock our doors? Why do we have all these police forces? Why do we have armies against each other? I mean, it's not just Americans. It's the whole of Western civilization, so-called, whatever, you know, I mean, loosely called Western civilization, um, laboring under a misapprehension about what human nature, in fact, is. What, what I think I can contribute is, is to say and to draw attention to what is in fact our evolved nature, what is our innate, um, uh, what are our innate tendencies and expectations. Now, when I spoke to the people, some of the people at, at the Center for Cognitive Studies when, when I was up there some years ago, they said that they didn't, they didn't accept that there were such a thing such things as expectations, innate expectations, as I was postulating. And but they did say, well, if you say so, then it's up to you to prove it, to demonstrate it, which I think I've, I've done quite clearly and not just attempted. But I think, you know, the, these are, these are um, things that have, have stood up now over the passage of time because my book, when I finally did write it, the continuum concept came out first in England in 1975 and then in, in America in 77 and other countries. Um, later. Um, this happens even when babies are drinking their mother's milk. They're still throwing up. They're still, they're still violently ill. There's a, a lot of, you know, contractions and pain and so forth. Now, why is this? Why on earth, how on earth could we conceivably believe that we are evolved after hundreds of thousands, nay, millions of years into what we've now become, which is Homo sapiens, without without somehow solving the, the, uh, the problem of digesting our own mother's milk. I mean, no other animal has this. And it stands to reason that our mother's milk is digestible to us just as it is to every other animal. So why, why do we have indigestion? Well, I think it's quite clear that, that the reason that we have indigestion so uniformly, mind you, the people that I saw in the jungle never had indigestion unless they were violently ill with some fever or something, the babies, they never threw up. They didn't certainly routine, routinely throw up. And they were also not wriggling and struggling and arching and flexing and squeaking and so forth like ours do normally. We keep saying normal because we've never seen any, we've never seen a comfortable baby is, is the truth of it. Well, what it is is stress. I mean, the babies are so stressed that they can't keep, keep their food down. One of the great things is that the first minute that a baby is born, it's opposed by being taken out of the womb and immediately, well, first things are stuck up its nose and things are stuck down its throat for reasons. They're always technical reasons. I mean, to take out mucus or to do this or to that, whatever it is. Okay. And then weigh it and measure it, which isn't doing anybody any good to weigh and measure a baby at that incredibly sensitive time in its, 
in its life. I mean, that's, it's, you know, for what, the Bureau of Statistics or something, no one ever sees it again. Or maybe because the, uh, they want to know what its astrological sign is or something, but it's not going to do the baby any good to be weighed and measured whatsoever. What it needs is to be in its mother's arms, and the mother even more so needs to have the baby in her arms so as to have this, this beautiful moment of falling in love, which is all choreographed by these exquisitely evolved hormones, which make it happen right away. Because if you weren't interested in this total stranger, who isn't too cute at that stage anyway, is probably all bright red and gooey and everything else, but you, you are all programmed to fall madly in love with it and to put its life even you know, above your own in your caring for it. Because if you didn't, I mean, we wouldn't survive. I mean, if you were exhausted after giving birth, you'd say, oh, well, forget it. You know, just drop that little thing in the river and don't worry about it. Or just you leave it there for a minute. Leave it, you know, I'll, I'll be back later. Well, uh, you know, the wolves would have gobbled them up by that time. So obviously it's very important that we um, have this great falling in love, otherwise known as bonding, otherwise known as imprinting, um, kind of ceremony which is built into us. It's built in because it has to be. It has to be for our survival. It has to have been there for us to have been the successful species that we are. Successful meaning that we survived, right? Over hundreds of thousands. Without Dr. Spock, amazingly enough, we managed to survive um, without any experts at all. So, I mean, what I'm, I mean, what normal is, is adversarial. So that the baby arrives, and I insist that it expects, it has an innate expectation that it will be among trustworthy allies, and that whoever holds it and whoever is in charge of it is, is, uh, has it in, his, in, in her, her or his care will be someone who is friendly, if you like, who is on if I'm the baby, is on my side. Well, that's not what happens. They're not on my side. Whatever I want, they say no. I want to be with my mummy. I want to sleep with her. I want to be close. I want to be safe. I want to be with someone alive who's breathing and who's warm and who smells right and who feels right and who touches me and makes me feel my, my own flesh appropriately. Not a, a lifeless box, a lifeless cloth and hear myself screaming in my own ears and hear other people screaming around me and, and, and get no response because I feel, I feel when I scream when I'm a newborn baby, I feel when I scream that something's supposed to happen because I scream. That's why I'm screaming, not just to scream, but because I'm waiting, I'm expecting something. And it doesn't come and I just scream more until I'm exhausted. So what normal is, is adversarial. I hope it shocks people a little bit when they realize that what they're doing with all the love that they have in their hearts, and I have no doubt of that, is adversarial. When you're following the doctors or the experts or, or your mother-in-law or your mother or your sister or whatever it is, um, and, and you are feeding the baby on a schedule or you are denying it sleeping with you and being with you 24 hours a day, not less, um, you're being adversarial because it's perfectly clear that unanimously all the millions, billions of babies who are crying at this very moment because they want to be next to a live body, can they really, you really think they're all wrong? Couldn't possibly all be wrong. This is the voice of nature. This is the voice of not intellectually interfered with or um, uh, interfered with in any way. This is the straight, clear, pure voice of nature. The baby knows what it's supposed to have, and the minute you put it down, it cries because it knows, and it's letting you know, it's signaling you perfectly clearly, don't put me down, don't put me down. And we have built into us equally, without a dictionary, the knowledge of what that means when the baby goes, wah, wah, wah. We know it means pick me up, don't put me down, don't leave me, don't leave me.